So I was born in London in 1967. Uh, my mom's name was Elizabeth Lees. And, um, you know, we didn't know very much about her background. Uh, my mother and father were greatly separated in age. My dad was a lot older than my mom. And uh, when I was seven weeks old, we moved somewhere else because my health was so bad. Now, I just remember my childhood being very difficult. Um, when my father died when I was 10 years old, suddenly, and, uh, you know, that just threw our whole family really into disarray. We were, we moved uh, the night that he died. And um, I, you know, lived in about five different places from the age of 10. In fact, seven different places from the age of 10 to the age of 17. Um, I didn't realize at the time that my mom had a tremendous sense of displacement herself. Uh, I knew that my mom had been uh, abandoned as a baby in 1943 during the Second World War when she'd been born in London. Um, she'd been raised by an English lady, an English nanny, and uh, you know she was told that her mother didn't want her and that her father had been shot down um, over France. She knew that both her parents were Polish, uh, but she didn't really know anything more. And as I was growing up, she would say to me, Jenny, I'm a Russian Polish Jew. That was her sense of identity. But the fact that she had no roots, you know, she was really uh, had lived a very turbulent life and that was passed on to her children. I grew up actually feeling quite intimidated and afraid a lot of the time, particularly after my father died. And so, you know, I wasn't really interested in my mom's background. I was just trying to survive myself. Uh, the night, oh, yeah, so this is the first image that we actually have of my mom. Uh, she was given to a, a nurse that looked after uh, babies during the wartime when she was about 10 days old by her Polish mother. She showed up at the nurse's uh, home or the children's home and said, please, could you look after my baby until the war's finished? Mum told me when the war ended, all the other children, were returned to their parents, but I was left behind like a, a left luggage parcel. And she told me that she never felt she belonged anywhere the whole of her life. So um, when my father died, you know, we, we moved home that night and never went back to the house that uh, I'd grown up in for the previous 10 years. I, I lived in quite a nice sleepy little village in Buckinghamshire, a village called Padbury with thatched cottages. You can uh, imagine you see them on the tin of fudge or, you know, those kind of things. Just really chocolate box England, I suppose. And uh, I lost all my friends. Um, we, we were disconnected from my father's side of the family. My mom had already left him at the time. And uh, I was living with my father. I was actually present when he passed away. He was playing the organ in church one night. And I ran home with my sister, climbed in the window and we tried to get a hold of our mum. And, and that was the end, really, I suppose, of my childhood as I knew it. Uh, this is me at that age. I was a very skinny little child. They didn't know if I would survive um, when I was growing up. But just shortly after um, we moved and I, I was going to a new school, I felt very scared and out of place. And I lingered behind in a classroom. We must have been learning about the Holocaust. And I remember seeing this image in a book on the table. Many of you will be familiar with it. It was taken in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, it was called Forced Out of the Bunkers. And it was taken really to show the, the, the Nazis' triumph or the Germans' triumph over the Jews. But all I remember is seeing this little boy and the fear in his face, you know, the aggression of the adults, some of the adults around him and the other adults who couldn't protect him. And I felt a sense of identity. I identified with him in some way that I didn't understand. I wasn't to know at the time at all that, you know, my family had a direct connection to the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. And that's something that I, I tell when I tell my own story. But I didn't find that out for many years. Uh, but I just wanted to bring that in. This is the first time I think that I remember seeing an image that related to the Jewish people and the Holocaust. And, it's never left me. As a photography lecturer, I share it with all my students. 
And it's a sad fact that today many, many people don't know where it was taken or the context that it was taken in. So uh, what my mom did know, well, I found out actually later on uh, in 2000, I, I asked my mom if she could tell me a little bit more about her background. I wanted to try and connect and, and find some way of, of finding out who she was. And it was then that I discovered she'd actually met her mother in the 60s, um, I think 1965 or 66 in London. She told me her mother's name was Helena, but she didn't know her last name. This is my mother's writing here in the middle. Uh, she says she was of half of Jewish half aristocratic family. Now, this is what she'd been told by her stepmother. Her, both her parents had divorced after the war and remarried. And it turned out that her father was very high up in the Polish military. In fact, he was in the um, Polish government in exile. He was a member of the Polish government in exile. And, uh, and her mother had married somebody that was the adjutant to General Anders, if you know who General Anders was. So mom met her, she met her mother Helena in a cafe and Helena told her a few things, you know, that she had a nephew who'd been so badly beaten by the Germans, he'd almost died, he'd gone to America, um, that she had a brother who'd been murdered by the, the Germans and, um, you know, that she had a sister who was in America or Canada somewhere. So that was really all mum knew about her, her family. Now, she was supposed to meet her mother again, but she never went back and they lost contact, which was really sad. So uh, in 2014, I, I decided, you know, no, 2013, I decided I, I really had to try and find out who my mom's family were, because I had this disconnect with my mom all my life. I didn't know her. I didn't know who she was, really. I mean, I knew her really, really well because of the way that I'd grown up. I didn't know anything about her, who she was. And it wasn't until uh, she died in 2014, very sadly, of cancer after a very sudden, short illness. I went down to Devon uh, for her funeral. And as I stood before her casket, I thought, you know, I, I, I just don't know who she is. And um, I spoke to one of my brothers. This is my siblings here. Um, Mom had seven children. I'm the second oldest. My sister Anna is the oldest. She's on the right hand side, then myself. And I said to my brother Peter, who's next to me, uh, Peter, you know, we went for a Chinese at, after her funeral. I said, Peter, I just looked at Mom's coffin and I, I just, don't know, you know, I don't know who she is. And he said, yeah, it was like going to a mafia funeral, wasn't it, Jen? You know, she had this air of mystery about her. So that was what really prompted me to trace her family, this disconnect that I had with her, not knowing uh, any context to her life and uh, trying to understand who she was, who she was in relation to me, to all her children. More importantly, I suppose, you know, mum didn't know who she was herself. So I came home back to the northeast of Scotland from Devon and determined that I was going to find out who her parents were, if I possibly could. So I wrote to Who Do You Think You Are, the magazine, uh, which happened to be on the shelf in Tesco's. I think I only saw it on there once after that. And just asked them if they could possibly help me. I told them what I knew, both my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather's name was Stanislaw Lees. He'd been an officer in the Polish army. My grandmother, uh, Helena, had um, also served in the army. That's why she told mom she'd given her up. And um, so I thought somebody must be able to help me. Jenny, so I wrote to him. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. Some people might not know. What, who do you think you are is? Because we've got people here from America of and course, from Canada yeah. and Israel. So it's worth just explaining to people very briefly what, who do you think you are is. Okay. I should probably ask Michael to do that, but I'll do, I'll do that. So who do you think you are is a television program that focuses on finding celebrities ancestry. Um, you know, they, they trace back one or, or several lines in their family. And uh, it just gives them an idea of their roots. 
as you can see from the tree. It's all about linking into your family tree, finding out who you are, where you came from. Now, I didn't, I didn't write to the television program. I found an address in a magazine um, and wrote to it and asked if they could possibly help me. I, I couldn't think of who else to ask. But then I remembered my grandfather was in the Polish army. He was an officer. And maybe he was also um, the, the secretary, international secretary, my mum had told me, of the Polish Ex-Combatants Association. So I found their number in the phone book and phoned them up and said, I'm looking for my grandfather. He, he fought in the Polish army during the war. He was the secretary of this organization. Can you help me? And the old lady on the end of the phone, who was in her 50s, I think, no, she wasn't in her 50s. I'm in my 50s. She'd been there since the 50s. She said, I know who your grandfather was. And that was a really uh, moving moment. And she told me to write to the Ministry of Defense, uh, the Polish section and in, in, uh, in this country, in, in Britain, and that they would be able to give me my grandfather's records. So I phoned them up the same day and they found my grandfather's records in no time. Uh, they said, we have, I think, about 12 Stanislaw Lees. Only one was an officer. So it was then that day that I learned my grandfather came from Lviv, uh, Lviv, as it is now in Ukraine. And they told me to send them some money and they would send me all his records. So a couple of days later, I thought, well, maybe they have my grandmother's records as well. I had no way of tracing her because I only knew her, didn't know her maiden name. So they said, yes, we have your grandmother's records as well, Helena Lease. So I, they, they said to, you know, just send them some money. They would send me the records translated. So I had to wait about three months for that. In the meantime, I started contacting groups online that I thought might be able to help me. Well, about, I suppose, the end of July, the beginning of August of that same year, I'd written off for the records in April, but about July or August, I received the records through the post. And for the first time, I learned my grandmother's name was Rothenberg. And um, about the same time, I heard back from Who Do You Think You Are, who'd initially said they couldn't help me and said their Jewish expert had seen my letter and wanted to help. And that was Michael, who's present today. So Michael asked me what he discovered and said that he would help me to, to find my family. He believed they were Jewish because my grandmother had said she came from Stri in Ukraine now. Had been in Poland. Jenny, I was going to say, you, you said Michael's going to help you, but people don't know why he would be able to help you. Yeah, so Michael, uh, Michael at the time, he was the Jewish expert. I think you still are, Michael. But who, who do you think you are? One of their Jewish experts. And he also had set up Jewish research indexing. Uh, if any of you are interested in genealogy, um, Jewish gen, Michael was involved from the very beginning with these and, and has been extremely helpful uh, in, you know, getting all these old documents online and helping people connect with their families. He's, he's an expert. I think he was given an, an OBE the other year by the Queen. Can I just stuff. add that Michael has information about all the families of the Jewish people living in Scotland? Yeah. And if anybody wants any help from Michael, if, it's, if they send us an email on info at glasgowfoi.com and our normal email address, we'll be able to connect you with Michael. Yeah. So, you know, they, who do you think you are? Ask me if they could give my information to Michael. And I said, yes, absolutely. Please do. And I think the same day Michael got back to me and he'd found my grandmother's family. Uh, their name was Rothenberg. We don't have time to go into all the details here. But he sent me an email that said, Jenny, you do realize this makes you Jewish. Now, I had no idea what impact that statement would have on me at the time. I was just delighted, you know, that I'd found out. In fact, a few days before I'd made contact with Michael, I'd sat down. I'm a Christian and I prayed 
that God would show me if I was Jewish or not. I don't know why I prayed that. I just felt that I needed to. And then, you know, Michael came onto the scene and he was able to say without without any shadow of a doubt that my grandmother was fully Jewish. And therefore, because my grandmother was Jewish, my mother was fully Jewish and I was fully Jewish because Judaism passes through the mother's line. So I told my siblings because we'd, because my mom's life had been so disorganized, she'd changed her name multiple times. She changed our names multiple times. She married five times before she passed away. And there was nothing concrete. I'd even lost my father's name when I was 11. I'd had to change my surname. My grandmother changed her surname multiple times to hide her identity. And when we found out that we were Jewish, my brother said to me, well, you can't get much more rooted than Abraham. So it opened up a whole new world to me. I was going to, I was going to say, sorry, Jenny, obviously you've just described a very unusual and confused life which is very different from most of the people that probably are on this on this zoom tonight and it's very difficult for us to understand how difficult that must have been for you but clearly when you realize you were Jewish that must have made a big difference and I assume that's where the Israel connection came in. Yes that's right I began once I discovered that I was Jewish I began reading you know, about the Jewish people desperately trying to find my family. And, um, you know, I was searching through lots and lots of records. I wanted to find living family. And I did uh, eventually find living family in Israel. And so I wanted to go to Israel, um, you know, because I was a Christian. I had read a lot, you know, about Israel in the Bible, loved the Jewish people from that perspective. And knew, you know, that there, there was a, there was just something special about the land and, and really wanted to go. But I think the thing was, I was beginning to make a connection with Jewish people within a year of finding out that I was Jewish. Michael was the first Jewish person that I remember meeting. Actually, it was really interesting because I got in touch with him in August. Brian was going down to a football match a few days later. And uh, I said to Michael, oh, I'm, I'm going to be in Glasgow um, in a couple of days because my husband's going to a football match. He said, I live in Glasgow. And so that was when I first met him and Jane. We went, his wife, Jane, went for a coffee and he was the first person that I met. Um, but I began just immersing myself in um, trying to find out as much as I could, you know, about the Holocaust, about my family. And I was studying photography as well. One day this image came up on my uh, computer and because I love photography, I was absolutely blown away because as it says, this photo, 1945 photo of three Bergen Belsen inmates led to a search for the identities of the woman and the little girl whose hand she's holding. And they'd been identified. So I like the, this page which was called Seeking Kin, Kin by Hillel Cutler. Immediately Hillel Cutler, a journalist, got in touch with me and said, who are you searching for? And I said, I'm searching for my grandmother, my grandmother's family, my grandmother was Jewish. And Hillel wrote an article in Scotland, a desperate bid to uncover an unknown Jewish identity. Um, and I was so impressed with how he wrote the article that I wrote back to him and sent him a thank you card and stayed in touch and began a conversation. And it was really through that conversation with Hillel that I became engaged with the Jewish people. He encouraged me to go to the shul in Aberdeen and, um, and he himself made aliyah to Israel. And so he began to tell me about anti-Semitism and the issues that Jewish people were facing today. It was the first time I'd ever become aware of it. And it was shocking to me. I learned as a Christian that Martin Luther, who of course is the father of Protestant uh, Christianity, uh, had written a book, The Jews and Their Lies, that Hitler had used. And it, I just had no idea. I was very ignorant. I think like maybe a lot of people are. I just assumed after the Holocaust, after the Second World War, that the Jewish people would be safe. 
that they'd been given, you know, that they'd returned to Israel and that nobody would even think of harming them in that way again. Boy, was I in for a saw. Just put this, I'll just touch on this slide. I, I went through my family's history and tried to find all the members of my family that I, I could name. These were all the members of my family that I found that perished in the Holocaust, that were murdered in the Holocaust. A photograph here as well of some quite close relatives that I uncovered and my mom's writing, my mother's brother executed by firing squad in Poland. So I began to ask the question, I suppose, what, well, what about the Jewish people today? What's happened to the Jewish people today? And because I was engaging so much online, um, algorithms mean that they'll throw up, you know, whatever you've been looking at, you're going to start getting more of that to look at online. That's the way that uh, the internet works. And one day I was sitting on Facebook, I haven't put the actual image that I saw on this page here, but um, I was sitting on the internet and up came an image of a little girl's bedroom. There were bunk beds, you could easily see it was a child's bedroom and her bedroom was absolutely soaked in blood. It was taken by the Israeli army, the IDF, just simply to show um, what had happened. It was a record of the crime scene. And uh, I read some of the comments. I, I, I just could not get this image out of my mind. And one of the reasons why was that my daughter, this little girl, Halel Ariel, was a dancer. She'd been dancing in Jerusalem the night before. She was 13 years old. And her parents had allowed her to sleep in while they went out in the morning because she was tired. And while she slept in, a 17-year-old Palestinian boy climbed in the window and stabbed her to death multiple times. And um, my own daughter, or our own daughter, Faith, was a similar age, also a dancer, loved dancing. And uh, she was having hospital treatment for severe burns on her legs at the time that this happened, and um, couldn't take part in a school production that she wanted to, and she was heartbroken. And maybe, the two things together caused me to pause more than I would have done. But, you know, sometimes all we need is something that allows us to make a connection. So I'd been on this journey up to this point. I, I'd had to stop reading about the Holocaust because I found it so overwhelming. And now I discovered that this little girl had been murdered just simply for being Jewish. And this yeah, is... Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask, is that how your Jewish interest then turned more towards the terrorism in Israel and how yeah. the Israeli people are affected by that. Yes, this was my first real introduction to something that I was later to learn, you know, that there are countless numbers of uh, victims of terrorism in Israel. Um, which I had, I had, I just hadn't known. And I knew if this had happened in another country, country it would have been all over the world news so we made plans to go to Israel but beforehand I wanted to write to the parents of little Halel Ariel I'd seen her father Amakai wanting to pray on the temple mount and he, he wasn't allowed to because Jews are not allowed to pray on the temple mount and um, he was he was crying and saying what more can you do to me you know, I, I, if I want to pray, I'm going to pray. And I thought, how can people stop you from praying, especially praying for your daughter? So I asked my friend Hillel, the journalist, if he could put me in touch with somebody that knew the parents of Rina, uh, of Hillel Ariel. And he said, Jenny, I have a school friend who lives in Samaria. You know, she may not know her, but she'll be able to get you her address. And she put me in touch with the lady on the picture here, uh, Tammy Wise, who's here tonight as well. And Tammy kindly gave me Rena's address and I wrote to her. I wrote to her in Amakai and just said there were a family in Scotland that were praying for her and we were devastated at the loss of their beautiful daughter. But I felt I, I had to do more. So that same year, we went to Israel for the first time. And uh, Tammy and Avi, her husband, invited us to their home um, in Neria. 
And so we, we went to visit them. In fact, what she said, or what everybody told me, was there were no shortage, there was no shortage of terror victims in Israel. So we arrived in Tel Aviv, and we went to, we went to visit Tammy on the way up, uh, on the way up north uh, to Naharia to visit Hillel, who was moved, who moved there. And this is their view, Tammy's view, from their village um, in, in Samaria. Now, through, I was still doing genealogy at the time, and I managed to find a cousin who was living in Tel Aviv, um, Rina, cousin Rina. And so we went and met her. Uh, it was just amazing to actually find family, blood family in Israel, and it tied me so much to the country as well. And so we went back and we took our children we took them up and down the, the length and breadth of the country. And as you can see, Israel is a wonderful place to visit. Uh, they, the children enjoyed the Dead Sea and some of uh, my cousin's ice cream. She, she has an ice cream shop in Beersheba. Very well known ice cream, I think, as well. Now, I came home and um, I could, still couldn't get the idea of telling these stories out of my mind. I, a seed had begun to form in my mind that I wanted to actually uh, tell these stories because I'd started looking online and there was no, you know, there was nothing. I couldn't find anybody uh, covering stories outside of Israel. But this lady, who you will know as Kay Wilson, uh, Kay has actually changed her name to Tal Hatov. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it as a result of the attack uh, that she suffered. But Kay had been walking, or Tal had been walking with her friend Christine Lucan in the Mata Forest uh, just outside Jerusalem in the Jerusalem Hills in December 2010. And um, they'd been attacked by two Palestinian men who were laying in wait with the sole purpose to murder Jews. And they come across these two women. Um, they ask for water, and Tal answered in Hebrew, I believe. And then, you know, she realized this wasn't a good situation, and 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 they tried to to walk away, but the men came up behind them and uh, captured them. And you can read Tal's written in her own words online what happened to them both. Uh, absolutely horrific attack. Now, Christine Lucan was an American Christian. She wasn't Jewish. She was in Israel because she loves Israel and the Jewish people. She was an evangelical Christian. And um, they murdered her because they thought she was Jewish. They attacked Tal as well. And um, she received 13 stab wounds with a machete and 30 broken bones, over 30 broken bones. They left her for dead. Um, incredibly, she, you know, she witnessed her friend obviously being murdered. And uh, incredibly, she actually survived that attack and decided she, she didn't want to die where they'd left her. And she would try, get up and walk somewhere else to die. And she made it back to... Um, I don't want to say civilization because they weren't outside civilization, but she made it back to where some people were having a picnic and just appeared, obviously, in a terrible state. And uh, these people managed to get her help. And she says when she was in hospital, the last thing she remembered before she went under for an operation on all her injuries that I don't think they expected her to, to survive was that it was a, a, a Muslim... Um, a Muslim surgeon who said, Muhammad, pass me the knife. And so she's, very, she's worked a lot with uh, Palestinians as well following this attack. And she's very clear that the men that attacked her are the men that did, you know, were, were the ones that, that she cannot forgive for what they did. So the reason I've brought her in here is she was writing, she was speaking out online about uh, Palestinian terrorism and the pay to slay, how uh, governments 
American and British governments that were giving money to the Palestinian Authority, that money was then being filtered off into terrorism. And actually, um, Palestinians are rewarded for murdering Jews. They're given a monthly stipend. Their families are given a, life, a lifetime of support if they murder Jewish people. And so she was outspoken, you know, trying to bring people's attention to this and fighting the government to say this has to stop. You know, I think at the time, the last article that I read, her, uh, her attackers and Christine's murderers had received over £70,000 uh, in reward for what they'd done. Um, you know, this was the article that you can find online. Um, Tal obviously got to hospital and then they had to go and find Christine Lucan's body. And you can read her book and you can buy it on Amazon, uh, The Rage Less Traveled. And if you want to learn more about uh, Tal's story, I would recommend that you buy it and read it in her own words. I think she's one of the most courageous people I've ever met. And I, well, if not the most courageous person. So I reached out to her because I thought, well, she's, she's a public figure. You know, maybe she, if I want to go to Israel and start recording stories of terrorism, she would be the person to approach. And you can read what kind of person she is here. I just think this is an incredible quote. Evil doesn't make me cry. It's kindness that makes me weep. When you experience goodness, and I've been at the receiving end of so much goodness from so many people, I wouldn't want to give them the privilege of making me cry. I just wanted to meet her and, you know, and record her story, but also record other stories. So that was in 2017. I first reached out to her on Facebook. Sorry, Jenny, to interrupt. Obviously, one of the things you've done is you've written a book. Yes. And, and we put some information in the invitation about your book. Yeah. And can you maybe just explain what made you decide to write that book and tell the story of all these different um, victims that you came across? Yes. Um, I can actually go a little bit further in my slides and I'll, I'll go a little bit more to that. But what I began to, I just couldn't get these stories, I was hearing more and more stories I, I, and I couldn't get them off my mind. I, I was studying photography at the time and I, I realized that it was something that just wasn't being taught. The, the, the main, main media news is biased towards the, the narrative that's told about Israel, I was beginning to realize it was unbalanced, wasn't correct. And these horrendous stories of which there were thousands and thousands, just weren't getting any proper coverage. And I thought as a photographer, particularly a documentary photographer, I, I, wanted, to, um, I wanted to do something about that. I wanted to provide uh, at least a few people with a voice outside of Israel and, uh, and bring awareness to the church was my main goal actually was because I'm very involved in the church and I wanted, uh, you know, all my Christian friends to understand what was happening in Israel and to get behind the Jewish people and to begin to stand up about attacks like this. That was my motivation. Um, and also because I was doing a photography degree, I thought it was something that I could really justify doing um, for university as well. So the idea began to form in my mind and I was given the opportunity to interview and photograph um, Holocaust survivors that were connected to my family, um, Adam Adams and his wife, Alicia. Um, their son, Charles, is with us tonight. And I went to London. I'd never met any Holocaust survivors before. And I listened to them and I realized this was living history. And yet, you know, the Jewish people are still facing the same kind of hatred in their own land. So uh, I listened to Adam. He was just so lovely to me. He was concerned about my camera in London, you know, and yet he told me this horrendous story 
Um, he'd survived by being in a, a hole in the ground for eight months. He lost every member of his family. Um, but Ellie Fiesel, a Holocaust survivor, said, when you listen to a witness, you become a witness. And you see, it was all of this together that made me realize, you know, once you hear something, once you know something, you have a responsibility to do something about it. So that's Adam there. Uh, sadly, he passed away in lockdown. So we decided we would go to Israel and and get these, you know, trying and interview as many people as possible. So I have to add something a little bit lighter in here. We we went back to visit Halal, and uh, he loves McVitie's ginger nuts. So you can see how delighted he was here with his delivery of ginger nuts. And in return, he took us up to Matala. And we met his friend, Avav Weinberg, who is, uh, I wrote down actually what he does. He's an uh, ice hockey. Um, he's involved in ice hockey in Israel, the national team. But he lived up in Matullah and Halal says, do you want to come and see him? Do you want to visit him? So he said, yes. While we, he lives right up in the most northern tip of Israel and on the way to some to where he was building his house we had to pass the border with Lebanon and up on the border with Lebanon as you can see was this lovely rocket launcher facing into Israel now you can see how close it is um, with Ayatollah Khomeini and in Arabic and Israel saying we're coming to get you and so that was really confronting you know we love Israel we love the country but here's our little boy Seth standing looking you can see how close that was to where uh, Lavav was building his house and he said he wasn't going to leave just a few years later you can read this article online Hezbollah's tunnels were exposed under his apple orchards um, anyway I, I began to read as much as I could and I came across this one book this is the only book I could find, A New Shoah. I would advise you to read it. Uh, Arnold Roth's story is in here, and so is Steve Bloomberg. I was just reading, reading it before I came online and so moved by what they wrote. This was uh, published in 2009. And uh, in their introduction, this echoes, this is why I did what I did. This book is intended to rescue from oblivion an immense reservoir of suffering to elicit respect of the dead and love for the living. That is one of my main motivations. And, and to put it into a photography context, I really believe there are things nobody would see if I didn't photograph them. Diane Arbus, of course, famous Jewish photographer. So we went to Israel in 2018, armed with you know, nine people, that, that we were going to meet in person, photograph and interview. And I decided I would collate these stories. I wasn't sure about making a book when I went out there. I just wanted to, to get that, record their stories and take their portraits. These are all the people that I met. Now, I'm not going to go into every one of their stories tonight, but you can read them in, in the book, Do You Know My Name? When I actually went there, I didn't even know I was going to call the book that. So we went all over, actually. Tammy uh, arranged for us to go around the Shomron, or, uh, Judea and Samaria. We traveled all over Israel to record these stories. This is Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, the Mount of uh, Blessings, the Blessings and Curses. And nestled in between here is Shechem or Nablus. And you may have seen on the news uh, just this week that two German tourists went into this city, not Jewish. They had a tiny Israeli flag on their car and they were lynched. They managed to get out alive. But I heard them interviewed and they said, you know, they, they supported the Palestinian people, but this had blown up so fast and they seriously believed that they could have been killed simply because they thought that they were Jewish. I have to include this. So before we went to interview one of the people, we, I was with Tammy and Brian. Tammy's on the right-hand side there. 
And um, she, we, we were going to meet a friend of hers that was going to take us around. And she said to me, Jenny, see that number on the, on the tree there? She says, that's in case there's a terrorist attack. Because <laughs> she left me. Uh, she left me and the kids while she and Brian went to get the car and and uh, and uh, um, guide. And she says, if there's any trouble, call that number. Shocking, just shocking. Some little children from the region have to put in some photographs. So the first person we arranged to meet is Steve. And Steve's available tonight if you want to ask him any questions. So Steve was born in London. He was the first person that I met not long after I got off the plane. I was really nervous about doing this. I'd never done anything like this before. I'm not afraid to talk to people who've suffered or who've been through trauma. I, I, I'm not afraid. I think we, we must connect. We must um, we must find a way to reach out. And so that didn't put me off, but I just didn't want to, I, I didn't want to do a bad job. I think that's probably the best thing to say, but Steve was so lovely and um, put me at ease right away. So in 2001, um, Steve was driving his wife at Takia and his pregnant wife, I think five months pregnant and his children home after choosing school books when his daughter says, dad, someone's shooting. And he pulled over, pulled his car over, and he told me that he realized his wife was gone. And he, had, he, he was laying on the road and he said he just knew he had to survive for his children. Now, Steve was paralyzed in the shooting. Um, he couldn't go to his wife's funeral, I think. And his 16 year old daughter was also paralyzed. He talked to us a lot about um, just how it is to be disabled in Israel, in London. You know, he, he's become an advocate really for disabled rights. Very soft spoken, loves football, told us about his daughter, um, Zippy, who that year, 2018, had won a skiing competition. Uh, in France, and you can see him, him showing us there. He was just so impressed with Steve's attitude. It, it just, um, it stayed with me ever since. I believe that with the help of God, we must look at the positive things that he's given us. And, uh, you know, Steve told me that people have, had said to him at the time, you know, if he wanted to stay in Israel, and he said, why wouldn't I want to stay in Israel? And if you want to ask him questions, please do so at the end. But he was just the best person to introduce me really to all the interviews that I did. So thank you, Steve. The next uh, person I met, Adva Bitan, uh, she lost her two-year-old, well, her, her two-year-old was injured. She was the youngest victim of terrorism uh, in the interviews that I did. Uh, her little girl, Adela, was in the car seat next to Adva. And she was driving home from her home, from her mother's home in Ariel to her own home when uh, five teenage boys started throwing rocks at the car. And Adva, who's um, a university professor, ended up under the, underneath a lorry. Um, you can see images of the car and her little two-year-old daughter, Adela, was so seriously injured um, that there wasn't, you know, that they didn't think there would be any hope for her. You can see Adva after the accident, if I could give my life for hers, I would do it because every mother would do that for her child. And Adela lived until she was four. And uh, Adva had to fight for her, had to fight for her uh, care in hospital. And eventually um, she lost her battle. Little Adela lost her battle. Adva has set up the Adela Foundation. And she spoke to me about how the community that she lived in had rallied around her, how wonderful it was to have a community where people really cared about each other. And she said she set up a foundation not for, for survivors of terrorism, but for people that had no hug, nobody to support them. Maybe it was 
a loss through a, a, a traffic accident or cancer. Um, so, and of course, she, she just, to go back to her image, she was just almost glamorous um, in her appearance, but just so lovely. The next lady I met, uh, no, the next place we went was actually to Hebron. Uh, we went to Kiryat Arba, which is where Sarah passed away, Sarah in the Bible. Um, and it was the most hostile of the places that we went to. If you could feel a sense of tension anywhere, it was in Hebron. And uh, we had a guide, um, Zippy Slissel. I have her story in my book. Her father was murdered in Hebron. There's a very, very small Jewish community in Hebron. I think 7%. And the, the Jewish community are not allowed into Hebron, into the city of Hebron, which I think is about 92% of, uh, of the entire city is, is Palestinian. It's a very small area that are Jewish people. Um, but we went to visit Rina Ariel, the mother of Halel, uh, the, the little, little girl that had started me on this whole journey. And this was the hardest visit that we made. Um, it was easy to see. I went, we went with Tammy. Tammy came with us, Tammy Wise. And our two children, Faith and Seth, were with us. Um, it hadn't been that long before, just two years before, that Halel had been murdered. And it was... Uh, it was very difficult, but easy to see how she'd been a target because they lived just slightly outside of the, the houses, on, kind of on the edge of the community. Um, her, here's her parents, Amakai and uh, Rina. Amakai had built an amphitheater so they could talk to people about, um, about the attacks. She told me that if I was to come back, she could give me any number of people to interview. I could stay with her for a few days. And she said, Jenny, I can introduce you to so many people. This was Halel's youngest sister who attached herself to our son, Seth, who was 15 at the time. Um, and she took him to play in the bedroom that Halel was murdered in. Now, as a photographer, I knew that perhaps I should take that photograph, but I just couldn't do it. I thought, no, they've gone through enough pain and grief. I'm not going to expose any more. Amakai um, explained to us that he planted a vineyard for Hallel, called the Vineyard of Hallel, how much she loved being in Israel. She was the only one, her, her grandmother, Hallel's grandmother, had jumped off the train to Dreblinka. She'd lost her whole family. Halel was the, the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And she said she, she wanted to always stay in Israel all her life. You can read her story in my book. But here's my dancer, Faith, talking to Rina and looking at pictures of Halel. And Rina said, if you want to know how people deal with terror, we understood in the beginning that we have two ways, either collapsing or trying to find a meaning of life through it. And what I found is everybody that I visited has, you know, really taken something terrible, evil, and turned it as much as they are able to for good. This is the road to Moda'in. Moda'in is... Um, actually where the Maccabees, I think, came from, or anyway, it's associated with Hanukkah. I haven't got all my facts in front of me, but this is where I traveled with Tammy to meet um, Racheli Frankel. Now, I'm sure many people will know who Racheli is because her son was one of three boys. Uh, Naftali was one of three boys that was kidnapped on his way home from school. Uh, he was 16 years old. They were kidnapped uh, by Hamas with the intention, I would imagine, of uh, extorting money or... But anyway, um, I'd, I read about Racheli before I came out. I read all the stories of everybody that I was going to meet. I wanted to know as much as I could about them 
before I met them. And she just really moved me. Every story moved me. Um, but Rachele, just the way that she carried herself, there was something that uh, I found really touching. Um, so they went to the, these three mothers, their, their boys went missing on their way home from school, two 16 year olds and a 19 year old boy. Um, and they had to go to the United Nations to plead for Israel to be able to continue to look for their sons. And Racheli, who was, the, I believe, the only English speaker, um, she said she was given a very short period of time. I think it was two minutes. And she said the atmosphere was so hostile. She just, she said it was awful, but I was just trying to do anything I could for my son, for them to search for my son. While the search was going on, she said they had support from all over the world, from every kind, uh, a branch or flavor of Judaism, if you like, and, and Christians and Muslims and Druze, everybody came together to support them. But the boys were found just outside Hebron three weeks after, and they, they'd been murdered shortly after they got into the car. Jenny, I'd like, just like to say that one of the reasons for the 2014 Gaza conflict, there was a Gaza war, and these boys were found just before the war started, and that was one of the reasons Israel decided to go into Gaza and try and stop Hamas yeah. um, from what they were doing. So it was a very important factor in the initiation of the Gaza war in 2014. Yeah, yeah. I believe... The Palestinian boy was killed in retri retribution and Rachele met his parents and said that was the last thing that she wanted to happen. Now, I'd spoken to a, a, a photojournalist who'd, who's covered many war conflicts before I came to Israel and asked him how he would approach photographing victims of terrorism. And he said to me, Jenny, you're not a journalist. You must have your camera around your neck. If they cry, you must record their tears. Um, he said, you must switch off your emotions. Um, and because, you know, it's important that you get the story back and people can connect with it. Now, I really questioned myself and thought I'm not a photojournalist after doing this because I was completely unable to do that. Um, I met Racheli, as you can see, just such a lovely open face. And um, actually not many of the people I spoke to broke down and cried, but she did. Um, she said it was unusual for her, um, but I asked how her children were coping with the loss of Naftali. And I decided there's no way I'm getting my camera out. It was as hidden as far as it could be underneath my chair while I sat and talked with her. McKelly says, in my inner landscape, there's so many dreams and failures and disappointments and successes and so much blessing is a choice you could make. For many people, they continue with everything, but there's no more joy. And I don't feel that happened to us. I think there's a lot of joy in our life. She told me that as a photographer, she doesn't take a telephoto lens to life. She takes a wide angle lens because that's better for her. So she tries to take in everything in her life that's a blessing. But the pain of, her, of losing Naftali uh, was obvious and even more obvious when I met her a year later in Edinburgh uh, with her whole family, um, was sitting on the steps of the Scott Monument here. I met up with them. We've had a lovely Israeli lunch, picnic lunch. And I just kept thinking, this is Naftali's family and he's not here. So uh, to come to Arnold, um, who of course you, you can ask, you can ask Arnold any questions after this. Um, so Tal or Kay Wilson, Tal Hartov, she said to me when I reached out to her, she said, uh, Jenny, if you want a really harrowing story, you need to contact Arnold Roth. She gave me his email address. So I emailed Arnold, he lived in Jerusalem, and um, I told him a little bit about my background because I thought, well, you know, I need people to trust me. I must be trustworthy. I think the Jewish people have uh, been treated badly 
throughout the centuries, particularly by Christians. And I, I wanted to be upfront right from the start. Why am I doing this? And so I told him about um, my grandmother and that her name was, uh, was Helena Rothenberg or Malia Rothenberg. She was born. And he said, Jenny, I'm really interested because he says my name was shortened to Roth. But really, you know, my name is Rothenberg. And his family came from the same part of Galicia in Poland as uh, my family did. So immediately I felt a connection. Now, Arnold's daughter, Malki, had been blown up in the um, Sabaro Pizza bombing, which many of you will know about in 2002 in Jerusalem. And so I arranged to meet him for breakfast, I think, um, in Jerusalem, and, and we were going to talk. Now, I have asked him before I've shared these photos, before I could share this photo of Melky's phone. Uh, Arnold and I talked for a long, long time. Uh, we talked for a long, long time, actually, about genealogy and, and how many members he'd lost in his family in the Holocaust and what it was like to grow up with survivors. Um, we just made a really good connection, but then we moved on to Melky and... Um, Malky had been standing at the counter of this pizza restaurant with her friend um, when the bomb went off. Now, the bomber had his bomb in a guitar case and he stood right next to the girls. Malky was the last of, uh, of the victims to be found. Arnold was given back her phone. And as you can see, there's the nails that have come out of it she was on her phone i just can't imagine i i, I think about this a lot how that, what that does to a parent so um arnold has been fighting for justice for malky because her um the mastermind behind the uh behind the murders uh alam tamimi she was a newsreader in ramallah I think she was 20 at the time. Uh, this was August the 9th, 2001. So she masterminded the whole thing. And she scouted out a restaurant where there were as many Jewish people as possible, Jewish children as possible, and planted the bomb in, in the, a, a human bomb. And then she rushed from the scene and got a taxi and went and read the news in Ramallah. Um, she was ar finally arrested and sentenced to 16 terms of life imprisonment for each one of the murders. 15 people were murdered in this uh, bombing. Another woman is in a permanent vegetative state. Um, but she was freed in what was called the Gilad Shalit deal, uh, a hostage deal, in, in return for one Israeli boy. Uh, 1,027 prisoners were exchanged for a, a, one Israeli soldier. I don't believe Arnold and Frimit were told that she was going to be released, but she ended up going to Jordan and she was on national TV in Jordan, where she still actually is. And she was not uh, repentant about what she'd done. Um, you can actually follow Arnold's uh, blog on Twitter this ongoing war or follow Arnold on there and he you know will keep you he, he'll tell you just this horrific story really um and how Jordan is protecting this this murderer she says you know when she found out how many Jewish children she'd murdered she wanted to hide her smile um but she couldn't now, the terrorists have received that amount of money. Um, I don't know when this was brought out. 2019, uh, 910, is that 1,000? No, million, million, yeah. In pay for slave funds in 18 years. And just to honor the victims of that massacre, uh, their names and ages, these individuals, um, it's just heartbreaking. So in Malky's name, uh, Arnold and, and his family set up the Karen Malky Foundation, which is the, uh, you know, is completely the opposite of um, 
violence. It's a way to support children of any nationality in Israel that have a, a handicap and their parents want to keep to care for them at home because Malka's younger sister, her younger sister Haya, is severely handicapped, severely disabled, and Malki loved her sister and loved working with disabled children. And that's a tremendous organization to support. Uh, Arnold finished off by telling me, you know, that the Malki Foundation doesn't exist to solve the problems of kids in Matullah, which we've been up to, northern Israel or Alat, southern Israel. It doesn't exist in order to provide equipment to tens of thousands of families around the country. It exists so that I can stand up and say there was a child called Malka and I want you to know about her life. I want you to know about her life. That's why I'm here. I want you to know about all these lives. So since we've been to Israel, we were actually, we've been four times now. We were actually there in uh, just over December and the beginning of January. Every time I give a presentation like this, I leave a space for more victims because there, there's just no end to the victims. Uh, continuing, one died on Monday. You can go and have a look at the Jewish Virtual Library and you'll get a list of terrorism victims in Israel. Uh, this is just since I did a talk in November last year. Um, I've taken this directly from their website. Um, I think there's been 17 people murdered this year, including these two little boys um, just murdered in February uh, that a Palestinian driver drove his car like a weapon into them at a bus station because they were Jewish. Yaakov Haley and Asher Paley. And that's their ages. In fact, I think Yaakov was five. Now here's the picture that's worth a million because through this whole journey, I, I've discovered that by opening my heart to people and listening to their stories, I am the one that has received the most, I think. I, I just can't begin to say now what these people mean to me. Here, here I am with Tal and we met with, uh, well, all of us met together for breakfast in uh, the beginning of the year. And... Um, I, you know, I will stand up and tell these stories as much as I can because we've so much to learn from people that have been through the worst things you can imagine and have come, you know, and come out and are wonderful people at the other side. Um, to quote a photographer, Annie Leibovitz, the thing you see in my pictures is that I'm not afraid to fall and I was not afraid to fall in love with these people and that's exactly how I feel. I haven't had time to go into the other stories. Hava Shatsky and Karen Hava lived near Steve Bloomberg and Tammy Wise when her daughter, 15 year old daughter Karen, was uh, killed in a pizza bombing. And Rabbi Sh uh, Shirky from Jerusalem, very well known rabbi, and his, his son Shalom, he was killed when a car rammed into him on Holocaust. Uh, on the eve of Holocaust Memorial Day. And there uh, we are, and uh, Zippy Schlissel from Hebron, uh, whose father was killed when he was in 64 by a terrorist breaking into his caravan and stabbing him to death. But as for Israel, it's a land the Lord your God cares for, for the eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. 